All right, well, I have a lot to live up to now with Sarah's introduction, but thank you so much. And yes, this, I think, um, one of the things I've so enjoyed about working with Sarah and the team uh, from Total Health Conferencing is just always keeping up on the latest and greatest. And I think this meeting in particular, for those who are virtual, you've missed out on this uh, amazing experience in Sedona, uh, which we definitely have, uh, have recharged and, and renewed ourselves. So today we're gonna do a whirlwind uh, of just kind of focusing on risk stratified survivorship. Um, I didn't go deep into the ASCO abstracts. Uh, you can look back on Total Health's website and go through the abstracts, but we will take some of the premise from uh, some of those abstracts as we talk about risk stratification. Here are my disclosures, and uh, let's jump in. We'll quickly right size that when we talk about survivorship, we mean from the diagnosis through the lifespan, and that's very different than how survivorship is often delivered in practice. And so I think it's important to think about how you're conceptualizing the whole patient from the time of diagnosis, and then different of how you would access resources and, and different types of, of um, needs that you identify in your survivor population. I think this slide is telling, and this is a, a great slide to even show administrators that you know we are only growing in numbers because we have so many patients living with and through their disease. We've heard this morning, um, especially in regards to hematologic cancers, you know our patients are living a long time, um, even with disease, and they're ebbing and flowing and, and changing therapies, but we need to be managing those late and long-term effects because that's oftentimes what's a bigger risk to our patients in being able to optimize the um, emerging therapies and biomarker-directed therapies that we have for um, our patients. Most of our patients, two-thirds, are still um, um, over 65, and when we think about just basic risk stratification of survivors. Our youngest and our oldest are our two sort of easy populations to think about. Youngest because of that exposure to therapy and what that will do as they go through their course of treatment and into their next phases of life. And if you think about it from um, a very common uh, late effect like cardiotoxicity, it's suggested that young cancer survivors accelerate their risk to cardiovascular disease by um, as, as little as a decade and as much as 15 years. So that accelerates to um, something that is, is oftentimes um, a greater risk for our, our patients is important to identify. And that's very um, kind of telling with our older patients as well. And some of the abstracts that I reviewed in, in the ASCO um, Direct had to do with how we risk stratify and maybe using things like a um, um, older patient assessment or a frail assessment because using those types of tools can definitely help you identify which of your patients in your population of both acute and chronic uh, management will need a little bit more or need a, a, um, additional support as we think about their late and long-term effects. So this is a, a figure that I've used since we launched our program in 2006. This figure still is telling today, and I think it's very important as we think about survivorship to conceptualize how do we want to deliver it, what do we want that to look like, and then how do we build our community around survivorship. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces at the time of treatment, but a lot of patients don't ever leave sort of that treatment phase. And so roundabouts are very purposeful. And are we prepared for how we set those expectations to our patients? Are we prepared with our, our own care team and the extended care team to be able to manage those ongoing needs of our patients from sexual health to bone health to cardiovascular disease? And if we're not, we really need to think about those aspects of how we build out that community, which will not only make sort of our jobs easier, but it also is a better quality of care for our patients. And then when we conceptualize how we talk about extended survivors, that's really the continuity of care. And that is t that tends to be where we think about from the practical approach to survivorship, a survivorship clinic. You know, that's sort of the ongoing way we manage patients. Many of us across the country have found success in doing that using an advanced practice provider model where we incorporate our nurse practitioners or physician's assistants into the the, the ongoing care of cancer survivors in tandem with the primary care team. Um, but we have to have some way to
to sort of keep those patients in the fold because a lot of our patients will be on extended therapy. And if you think about your two greatest populations of breast and prostate cancer survivors, which um, encompass almost 40% of cancer survivors, many of them are on extended endocrine therapy and they have additional needs um, in relation to uh, their ongoing management and engagement with recommended therapy. Uh, I come from a practice of, of genetic testing I have for over 25 years. Um, so genetics is an important piece, not only in primary prevention, but obviously when we think about treatment planning for our, our patients who are newly diagnosed, um, treatment planning for patients who reoccur or will continue to be with us, and what about those patients when we think about them in a survivorship clinic. Uh, at ASCO last year, uh, we presented data from a, a year and a half long study in our breast cancer survivorship clinic where we identified identified another 15% of our survivors who needed update or initial germline testing. Um, and what percentage of those patients, which was about 12%, uh, which had a germline mutation, either a moderate or high penetrant gene mutation. So this is an ongoing need. We can't just think about it at, at one phase of care. We really need to think about all of these concepts uh, from a cross-cutting lens. And that's really where, once again, risk stratification uh, becomes very helpful. Because how do we manage survivors appropriately in continuity of care when we don't know their germline status, when we don't know if we should be more intensively, more frequently screening our patients. And then for the legacy of our patients, we know this is very important uh, for their family, for their children, um, and is, is often a big driver of why patients want you know, genetic testing. So thinking about it from what is your greatest challenge, it's important to think, and I've sort of modified this because at the time this was published, IO was not um, sort of a standard of care. Now that it is, there's very, um, you know, so, some similar yet different late effects, and important to think about, okay, who's the, the, the survivor sitting in front of me? What are they likely to experience based on their comorbid conditions, based on the treatment that, that they will be exposed to? And how do we prepare them to engage them, and how do we develop sort of that follow-up uh, for our patients? Um, when we think about uh, the, the changes that have occurred in healthcare, from bundled service to you name it, um, it's really frustrating because it seems like so much of the onus to manage survivors is in oncology. Um, surgery, it's very hard to, to engage and to keep them involved, um, and that's, uh, no offense, a, a, a side effect of bundled service. Um, um, and many of us have experienced that ourselves or with our family. So when we think about how we manage survivors, it tends to fall um, into medical oncology, radiation oncology, and then sort of the third in line would be surgical oncology. Um, but we need to have a plan, and we also need to incorporate other specialists and primary care into that plan. So risk stratification is important. This is a, a publication that came out a couple years ago, really talking about the need because of the complex nature of our patients, the cost of healthcare, and the growing number of survivors. We cannot think about it from a single lens. We have to think about it from the, the, the exposure or the patient that, that is sitting in front of us and what is the type of cancer? What is the level of intensity of the treatment? Those comorbid conditions. And then what tools do we potentially have in our toolbox or we don't have and how do we um, sort of sort of sharpen our tools or build those tools and when we think about putting them into a bucket because it's much easier to put patients into sort of a risk bucket um, a low risk patient may be low risk because they had um, a lower risk cancer or the risk of recurrence is lower and they have less sort of social or or financial needs but a high risk patient could be a low risk recurrent patient but high risk in regards to the resources and the, the um, access to care that they have. So these buckets will change, but from our initial lens, we think about it from the disease process, and then we sort of fold everything else around that. And then we think about how to build those tools. So the Office of Cancer Survivorship on the NCI's website has a nice figure kind of showing these different um, components of survivorship care, from psychosocial to physical to economic. And I think it's a nice visual because it helps us sort of hone in on what are the aspects that we need to think about 
from the diagnosis through the lifespan for our, our patients and survivors. When we break it down into the community that we need to build, that means all of our disciplines need to be able to have some level of engagement. We need to have some level of knowledge. You're not gonna feel confident turning over or doing shared care with a primary care if you don't feel that they understand the level of risk that that patient has. And how are we communicating and how are we sort of empowering that relationship? So building the community of practice isn't something we should take lightly. And I think that's one of the challenges I've seen with survivorship programs across the country is that it becomes very much a delivery of care within what we have once again in our lane but it doesn't really focus on, well, how do we build those partnerships and how do we build those referral pathways and how do we make sure that the partners that we work with understand how to co-manage the, the cancer survivor um, who has a complex set of needs. So we need to shift away from one size fits all. We don't do this with treatment. We are very biomarker driven. We are very informed as we develop a treatment plan. We need to kind of have the same lens as we think about survivorship care. Every survivor isn't the same. If you do one size fits all, not, not only is it not necessary and patients will, will not necessarily engage in it because patients have a whole level or spectrum of, of capabilities and engagement, but it's also not always necessary for the level of risk that that, that survivor has. So if we're doing one size fits all, it's very economically distressing and it doesn't work and it's not necessary. So we have to think about it from our risk stratification lens. This is the ideal, right? If we would assess them at the different landmarks and time points across the, the patient continuum of care, that would be ideal. But who's gonna do that and how do we have the tools and resources to be able to assess patients? But if we think about it really from that treatment phase, this once again is from um, an article a few years ago um, when CAR-T wasn't even standard of care and it sort of breaks it up based on the disease risk and then you would layer in obviously those other risk factors from the patient's comorbid conditions, lifestyle, um, you know, other existential types of, of concerns. But I think the important part is that baseline assessment and understanding those risks to start with is essential. Um, I know from our practice, we've added in you know, a cardiovascular risk assessment at baseline. If any of you are Epic users, you know, these are things that are built into um, Epic Galaxy, which is sort of the shared community of Epic. And so you don't have to reinvent a wheel. You just have to go and look and see what's out there. But certain things that are very common late effects for your patients, we need to know what that baseline is because it's it's really hard to manage patients ongoing if we don't have that initial assessment. So these next two slides are super dense, but they're from an article we recently published in the Journal of Cancer Survivorship. So I would encourage you to, to pull that if, if interested. But we've done a lot of work funded by the CDC and the NCI to look at shared care between oncology and primary care. And there were four cross-cutting themes that really um, were significant in the, the gaps in care for our cancer survivors. And that has to do with organizational structure, um, sort of patient and provider engagement and and communication, access to survivorship care and resources, and knowledge gaps. And I just wanna highlight a couple pieces for you. Um, so the first was from the primary care vantage point, sometimes they don't even know if the patient has a history of cancer sitting in front of them. They have very, very rudimentary um, um, electronic health records unless they're part of your bigger system and, and they luckily have you know, a more advanced EMR. Uh, but in our state of Kansas, we have a lot of really small, um, not sophisticated EMRs. So it's very hard to have that knowledge transfer just based on technology. The other, when it came to communication, I love the quote that's highlighted. Um, this was from a primary care that said, and then you get like a 432 page note that uh, you try to sift through and you don't know what's what. So we send them an enormous amount of information. That's not what they want. And on the next slide, what you'll see is one of the things they do want, they want a narrow sort of order set from us or a to-do list. So instead of sort of embedding it in 432 pages, um, literally giving a bullet list is essential. So we're actually building as part of an R01 that I have right now, order sets for breast 
breast, colon, lung, and prostate, which we will share with the world um, as soon as those are done. And the working group includes primary care physicians, oncology, and the care teams that really manage patients. So from a primary care vantage point, they do an excellent job doing primary care because they have best practices. They're incentivized financially to, to hit certain landmarks in regards to cancer screening and, co and management of, of chronic disease. So that is already in their skill set. So what we've done is looked at what is in their healthy patient assessment already. And for Medicare patients, it's very clearly laid out. And we've added sort of a survivorship module to that. And the nice part is that that's really what they want. They want to know, besides the stuff that I'm already doing, what do I need to be doing? And the other piece that I thought was so telling is that even things like colonoscopies, they're like, OK, super frustrating for the patient. I'm telling them one number. Oncology tells them another number. So there's inconsistent messaging because from the primary care side, they don't have the same level of knowledge that we have. So we can't expect them to look at these seven recommendations out there by professional organizations to determine the mom, the, when a patient should have a mammogram. We just need to tell them they get a mammogram every year, they get an MRI every year, whatever it is they need to, to know, we just need to digest it. Don't make it difficult, just do a bullet point. It is not insulting to our primary care collaborators. That's what they want. So this has been very telling in how we need to empower those partners. This was their wish list of what they need. And I thought, once again, very helpful. But one of the things that's even more important is whether we're from a community-based cancer center, academic-based, or health system, you know, we may have resources because we have a dietitian or a psychosocial oncologist you know, easily accessible. But a community primary care physician does not know those resources. They depend on us to sort of manage that. But if they're doing a depression screen on a patient and identify a patient in need, they don't know the best place for that patient to go. So the important part is that we do have even national resources that are virtual for our patients. And COVID really helped accelerate a lot of those resources. So how do we get those into the hands of our primary care? So on our website, cansurvive.com with a K, um, it, that's the, the R01 um, that I was describing. We've actually put together a toolkit that is allowing our primary care to not have to look all over the world to find these recommendations, but they can pull the psychosocial resources or financial toxicity resources easily um, so that patients um, will have access from that primary care vantage point too, because a lot of times they may be seeing oncology once a year, they may not be seeing them at all. And so how do we really loop in and share those best practices and resources? They also wanted sort of a pocket card. Wouldn't that be great to have a pocket? We all love pocket cards, um, at least I do. Whether it's clinical trials, whether it's best practice. And that was something that they wanted because they don't want to go and say, okay, do I follow the, you know, um, the primary care guidelines that I generally Really follow or do I use yours? And so make it easy, make it simple. And, and I felt like this was just important for us to know that I think we often make it too complicated or don't provide just those bulleted sort of to-do list points. And we really need to be doing that. So as we think about it from this ongoing assessment and management, we know there's sort of the, the checklist we need to be doing related to new or recurrent disease, the functional status and health status of the chronic management we need for cancer survivors, uh, a reconciliation of medications. And you know, um, some of our patients, and especially in, in the survivorship clinic, they will have been on something for 18 years. And that we're like, so who put you on this? And when did you go on this? They're like, I don't know. Who put me on it? I've been on it. I just keep taking it. So some, at some point, we have to do reconciliation of medications. And we have found that, once again, that's uh, some, a piece that we end up doing in the survivorship clinic. Um, Co-management of comorbid conditions. Role delineation of who does what. We need to serve as the quarterback. We need to make it a lot more, more accessible and practical. And that's really where I think the risk stratification and, and serving the role of the quarterback comes in very helpful. I do come from an excellent, excellent uh, football uh, community where Patrick Mahomes is our, is, is our quarterback. So I like to use Mahomes references. And, and I think that it's, it's definitely a place where um, if we serve that role, it really makes it easier for us because we've built that team and we build the, the players that we need uh, to help manage our survivors. So I want to thank you guys for your time. And I think we may have time for one or two questions if anyone has any. So thanks.
We do have a question from the virtual audience. It okay. says, what are some good first steps to building a survivorship program in community practice? So that is an excellent question, and I have a great answer for it, um, which I don't always have great answers. But the first is you need to do an inventory of what you already have available and accessible, and that is a survey. You do a survey for, and we did ours years ago, and we keep doing some updated ones. You can do a survey monkey, you can do whatever, but you wanna uh, assess everyone who touches your patient, from administrators to schedulers to you name it, and what we did is we really looked at what do we have, who are the people that you're referring to already? So if you don't have a cardio-oncologist, that's okay. But you may find that, that one of the oncologists always refers to this particular cardiologist because they um, are a great partner, they help keep our patients on treatment, and they help us manage those late effects. So don't reinvent a wheel. Start with an inventory, see what you have, and then identify gaps once again, from that survey, or what are things in clinic that take you a lot of time or you feel are gaps in care? So keep it practical, do a stepwise process. We also have that published. So if you search my name, you'll find a stepwise process to building a survivorship program, and we actually map that out uh, for you, and there's a nice little visual that can help you with that. So, great. All right. All right, well, thank you all for your time, and uh, thank you for being here.